a really lovely ceremony. People who came down to the courthouse, I think they just did it as a performer kind of thing. So um, I don't know that it changed me other than that I became, you know, I started voting and became very politically active right after that. So that was sort of the change for me. But Germans don't allow dual citizenship, so I, I had to give up my German citizenship. You say one other data. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it was pride. I wanted to be an American, so what I had to do is I had to explain to my family. That was the hardest. Mm -hmm. So I explained to them that I renounced my country of birth, but I did not renounce my family. And that really made it a lot easier because it took me 18 years to become an American. I started in the in 80, and it's only in 98 that I became American. Paperwork. I had to wait 10 years in Europe, and then I was told that I had the wrong color of skin. And I mean, you get a few of those, but I wanted to be American, and it was something. And I'm, I have that pride, and so it, it carries on. I think it's it's part of who I am now. And. But it was my family that I had to work on first. Um, my best friend, when, we, when I came, first said, I just cannot believe that you are leaving the king behind. And I said, well, I don't live with the king. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, it's part of Belgium being a monarchy where you, you have this respect for the monarchy. And I said, well, it's, it's a choice. And if our friendship is going to suffer, then we have a shallow friendship. I was honest with her. And we are still best friends. So she already came to America uh, three times now. But later on, she emailed me once and said, I wish I had done what you did. Because she understood that it was my passion, it was what I wanted. And, and so I consider myself an American person. I'm not. I am not a Belgian. I don't. And it's even going over back to Belgium. I waited until I was an American citizen to go back for the first time. So I did not see my family for a lot of years. And I was afraid they would not let me back. <laughs> so I said, only when I have that passport, I'm going to go back to see my family. So you, you have to give. And it's not for everybody. But still to this day, it's a very important decision, but I'm very, very excited and proud of it. So, so. And, uh, also, I think that uh, being a citizen helped me to um, put my mind in that I'm here, I live here, everything. Okay, when I say everything, it's, I'm not talking about my family, because all my family is in Honduras, my husband. But uh, because, okay, everything is here for me. Uh, my job, is my house, is my husband, is, uh, every day is here. So um, we, we, when I say citizen, I am a citizen. And when I have to say that, that helped me to feel strong here. And there is a reason I am here. It's not just because. So I think that helped me much better. You said that Germany said that you had to did they choose one. Yeah, one or another. They only allow me to. But how did they say? How did they state that to you? They just said that because when I when I call, well, I just just ask and and well, maybe I just heard it that you cannot. You need to choose one or another. They don't. Have, they don't give you the choice. Because when I called the British Embassy when I was looking at getting my citizenship, and I thought this is such a classic British statement. When I called to, to, bear, to find out what the status would be, and they looked at me, and they said on the phone, I said, Madam, once you're born British, you're always British. And I thought, that's a really British way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that no matter what, you can always get a British passport again if you want to. But I thought, you know, and I thought the contrast with what you said, what Germany said versus what, what Britain would say, um, was pretty interesting. I don't think they like it when you renounce. Because uh, yeah. even when I travel later, um, custom, well, why did you do that? And why are you an American? And so they were not very friendly. Mm -hmm. After that, it became more common. But at the time, they were not very friendly. They, how could you do that? And you know, it's going back to my friend. What, how, and it's a choice. Mm 
Well, it's interesting because I don't know, I don't know many Americans who have actually given up their citizenship. That is, those who have lived overseas or living permanently overseas would never come back. And I think that a lot of Americans may have the same kind of reaction to someone giving up their American citizenship as you know, some of you know, your friends who have done. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't met, I don't think I've ever met any American who's given up their American citizenship. I don't know if anybody here is aware of anybody. Well, you know, nowadays it's not quite as difficult to travel. I would imagine 20 years ago, even 30 years ago, the passport you carried was important mm -hmm. in allowing you access to countries. Mm -hmm. uh, visa requirements and things like that were much more onerous. Now, if you have an American passport, you can go to just about any country. Um, and of course, the EU, within the U EU, I mean, at the airports in Europe, you know, there's a line for the EU people and then there's a line for the rest of us. So they can travel pretty readily. But that wasn't the case 25 or 30 years ago, at which time having the right passport was probably really important. Uh, nowadays, it's probably not such, a, such an issue. Um, in, the, in the book, The Namesake, Gogo and his sister, they um, have children that have been born in America, and they, they, their parents are Indian, and they go back to India to visit families. And they always feel quite out of place when they go back to visit family in there. And they don't actually like going to visit India because they feel so out of place. Um, do you ever feel caught between two countries? Or you know, have you ever had that experience of when you went back, um, you didn't feel like you necessarily fit in, or you didn't, perhaps if you had your children, they didn't want to go spend ex extended periods of time over there? Um, Scott, I don't know with Canada, you know, what that experience would be like, kind of being caught between America and Canada. And with, with, this, with it having a brand new baby, how you yeah. kind of ex have yeah, an we're, American, a Canadian experience. I'm not exactly sure how dual citizenship might work and if we may be able to get We just had, my wife and I just had our first baby in, in November, a little boy named Lachlan. And uh, now uh, we're going to look into trying to get him dual citizenship, but I'm not sure if that's possible. Um, a lot of my uh, Canadian friends wondered what I was doing. Doing moving down to the states and stuff. Um, you know, when I when I first came up here, uh, I was I had been living in Guatemala with a lot of other expatriates from Canada and the states and and uh, Europe. And uh, it was actually it was, I got here April first in 2000, 2003, and uh, it was a lot of uh, people were concerned for me, saying you know because uh, the Iraq War had just started and uh, they were like you know you're going to a country of war and everything else and I was just like ah, you know. Whatever, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, I don't think that there's a there's. I, I I encourage everyone to come and visit me down here just because I you know I just like it so much and there's so many great places to see. My sister just came down for the first time uh, this past uh, summer with her kids, and being from the city, uh, you know, my niece loves riding horses, so we have a friend in Sundance with some horses, and she went riding horses, and you know they can't wait to come back down this summer, you know, so. Uh, there isn't there isn't a, a really big difference, but a lot I think some of my friends in Canada just kind of wondered like why would you, you know, what's the deal why would you want to move down there but it's, until they get here I guess it's a different story we see where it goes. Um, when I was at the University of California I had a friend who was from Turkey professor who was from Turkey and um, he had never taken American citizenship and neither did his children and when his son got close to eighteen. Right. Your war comment it reminded me of, he became very concerned because Turkey drafts young men at the age of 18 and his son who had grown up in Southern California was actually going to be expected to move back to Turkey and do military service in Turkey and so there there was a this is, didn't affect us me personally but there was a family struggling with this issue of citizenship and whether or not to take citizenship because of the military uh, service that was required in the back in the old country. So for some families, that is an issue you know, for their children. Mm -hmm. How about anybody else for, um, going back and forth with kids? Or, um, you know? Yeah, when I read the question, do you ever feel caught up between two countries? It never really would have affected. So I would have never thought about the question when I before kids, but now that they have kids and they're older and they talk now about princesses, and I think about my kids getting married, I'm like, ah. Oh, what are they thinking? Me pulling so far away from my home country, over here, away from my family, and 
just kind of sometimes it feel like it pulls things apart. Like, what was I thinking, marrying so far away? But there's good things here and good things there. It's like some, uh, sometimes I'm over there and I want to be here, and then I'm here and I want to be over there because it's both countries. Are really nice. And you, have you taken your children to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how often, have you, how often do you go back? We go about every year, year and a half, trying to go back. And your children are still pretty young. Yeah. It's funny, you think about it, I'm like, oh, down the road when they get married, you know, can, will my parents be able to come, or what's going to happen? You always think about that. We don't have kids, so. but uh, uh, as an adult, I, when we come back every year to, mm -hmm. to Honduras, mm -hmm. we celebrate Christmas together, my family. And uh, it's, there is a lot of things that I want to have him. And when I am there, yeah. there is a lot of things from him that I want to have there. So it, it's the grass is green on the other side. You always think that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, oh, I want to be there because. Oh, I want to be on the other side because. Yeah. So there is a wonderful, beautiful, beautiful When I am there in Honduras, I feel a kind of a freedom that I don't have to cook, I don't have to think about nothing in the house. Yeah. And when I come back here, it's like, okay, I come back to my real life <laughs> <laughs> with all the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and so, but for sure, we are on vacation. But I feel the same way, like a half is here and a half is there. I can catch up. Sit, yes, I have one son here and one son over there. And so, and the son that lives in Belgium never made it here because he has little kids and it's too expensive. And so, and then I have one that was younger and came with me. And so, he lives in Wyoming. He has little children too and grandkids. Um, I went back with them as his graduation present to see the family. Mm -hmm. He never really could adjust because he had lived here for so long. I go back and I go back as an American. I, I don't go back as a Belgian, although I know Belgium, but um, my family, I'm the American child. And I'm the oldest and they adjusted to it and they have little corners in their apartments with American things that to celebrate the daughter that's in America, so it's it's just something. It, they're very proud of it. They celebrate it. Um, it could be also because they are still very proud of the Allies from World War II, and that could impact, I think, the the way they view it us. So that's very important. It's not that I went to a country that Belgium doesn't love. They still very much wear T-shirts with American flags and. It's readily available. There is still this, this um, picture of coming to America being something very important. So I don't think it's it's. Um, I don't think I could have just living back over there. I don't think I could. I don't know what it is, but if you travel to Germany right now, everywhere they have purses and scarves with the British or American flag. <laughs> it's like the trend over there. It's like I don't quite understand. That's just kind of funny, and it's like. Oh, he, when we come to America, what strikes me right away is the American flag everywhere. Mm -hmm. In Germany, they kind of rolled it up and put it away. Like they, mm -hmm. they maybe say they probably they're German, but they never would show that. Like it's something I must like defend it for bad. Okay. And over here, it's um, and I think it's beautiful. I like it. I love the, the pledge of the legion, and I think it's very important these things. But it's like over there, they kind of rolled up, and here. They show it, and now they're kind of doing that over here, over there too, but with the British and the Amer American flag. It's kind of unique, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, when I grew up, we were the oddities everywhere. When we moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which honestly didn't have very many immigrants in the early 60s, and we all had British accents, and my parents had British accents. So we were the oddities in Sioux Falls. And then when we went to back to England, which we went fairly frequently. My mother was from a small village in northern Wales, so my mother would show up every couple of years with five American 
American children. And we were the oddities there, too. Um, and so we kind of, wherever we were for a little while, it felt like we were somewhat odd. And, uh, but actually, I loved going to England. I thought it was kind of fun. But we didn't have, we didn't have language barriers to deal with beyond, you know, kind of different accents. And so I think that that probably, you know, I could see where, like in the book, The Namesake, if your children, if your children, you don't know how to speak that language, that that would be challenging to go spend months at a time as a child in another country, or especially as a teenager, well, let's face it, you're probably not you know, the most flexible as you could be, um, trying to adapt to a country for a few months and trying to be suddenly sucked into a family that you really don't know that well. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I actually probably regret the most is I really didn't know my grandparents very well. Um, we would see my grandparents about once every three years. And that's an odd relationship to have um, with grandparents. And I see my children now getting to see their grandparents much more. And of course, it's easier to travel now than it was in the 60s. It's much easier to travel. But the travel to <coughs> Northern Wales used to take us two days, three days sometimes. And so I think that that's kind of part of it, is that the world has gotten smaller, and it is easier through Skype and a lot of other different ways to communicate with your families. What's hard for me sometimes is that I cannot tradition that the, the festivities and the traditions that I grew up doing as a kid, I would love to do them with my kids. This is why I'm sometimes sad that they cannot experience it. So when we go travel, it's really fun to try to look at the calendar and go to some of these things that they get to experience. Because you at night, you tell them stories about them. And it's, it's fun when they get to see a few of these festivities. My, I took my daughter back to Germany um, to see her grandfather when she was six. And the biggest problem we had, thank God I packed her roller skates in the suitcase, <laughs> um, was the food. American kids, European, uh, nowadays probably Europe has changed a great deal, but back, my daughter's 40, so you know, it's 20 some years ago, you'd have a cool shrunk, you don't have a, a refrigerator, so the, the milk was warm. I mean, they don't, they didn't, the Germans didn't believe in ice back then, so you couldn't get anything that was cold, and the milk was warm. My poor daughter at six drank black tea every day for two weeks because she wouldn't drink the warm milk. Oh, she's six years old, right? And she's not doing anything that mother wants her to do. She won't eat the food, she won't eat the milk, drink the milk, she won't. I mean, it was just, finally I had to go to the supermarket and, and just take her with me and have a point to things that she was willing to eat. Because um, American kids are very opinionated about they, what they want and they only want certain things. And it was really a struggle. Even when we went out to eat in, in restaurants, there was a lot of meat, um, and she wasn't used to eating a lot of meat. So, I mean, the struggles for me were, were more on a very, very intimate level in that I had a six-year-old who wouldn't eat most of the day, and so I spent my whole day preoccupied with trying to get her to eat a meal. Um, and then she got bored because she didn't have her friends or routines. And so every day she would put on her roller skates and, and she would go out in front of grandfather's house and just roller skate for hours by herself because that was the only way she could keep herself busy. A lot of that's changed. Um, you know, they have ice in Germany now. Yeah. <laughs> it was taken there by Americans, is what I understand. <laughs> and things are fresh over there. Like here, the milk has to travel such long distances. It comes from California. That's 24 hours away. The milk you buy at the grocery store in Germany just comes from down the street. You know, it's like maybe an hour away the most. So it's very, very fresh. Same with the eggs. When you go to the grocery store, the milk is, by the way, refrigerated now in Germany. <laughs> but when you buy eggs in Germany, they're not refrigerated. They're very fresh, and they, you, if, like I went over there, and I was looking at the refrigerator section because I was so used to having them in the cooler section. Well, I had to ask. I forgot that they don't refrigerate them over there. They just have them on the side, but they, you don't really need the fresh eggs. You really don't need to refrigerate. So the, Well, our time is up. If anybody would like to stay and ask any questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating. Well, thank you for putting this on. Yeah, thank you.